Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the government of Malta, I welcome you all to Malta and obviously to this meeting. And uh, basically, that's a tuna cage and sunrise when we collect eggs in the morning. So I chose this. It's quite a nice picture, picturesque. And um, I'll be talking about basically aquaculture, how it starts in Malta, <coughs> what goes on in Malta, and then I'll speak briefly about the strategy we have in place and also about research that we're doing at the center. So. This is the Aquaculture Center, okay, the Malta Aquaculture Research Center, which started up in 1988 as the National Aquaculture Center. It's a fort built by the Knights. As you can see, it's not a modern building. And uh, it's, um, it's used for our offices and also for the hatchery, where we have a pilot hatchery that produces approximately 2 million sea green fingerlings. Um, in the early 90s, the Aquaculture Center was set up to introduce aquaculture to the Maltese public and to investors and also as a pilot fish farm by Professor Carmelo Ajus, who is now an, an, an international aquaculture consultant. The center is located at Marsh Lock Bay, okay, in the south of Malta, and the first fish farm to be set up was P2M Limited, um, which was a, a business set up with Malta through the government of Monaco as well, okay, and we have cages here for sea bass and sea bream in the north of Malta. Since then, um, and then this is, this is uh, when the farms were set up in the beginning. You can see here we have an opportunistic species catching, catching fish from around the cages. cages. And seabus and seabreen farming was based on fingerlings imported by truck and flushed into cages. Okay? Uh, we had different types of cages. For example, old oil pipes used as, as a frame for the cages, far motion cages, which are semi-submersible. And today we have the, the modern HDPE cages. Basically, uh, the fingerlings are brought and they're fattened to market size and then marketed in Europe. So, sea bream and sea bus, Malta's annual production went up from the early 90s until the year 2000, where it reached over 2,000 tons. And then there was a drop again because of prices and uh, overproduction in the Mediterranean area, but now it's gone up steadily to about 3,500 tons per year. Our last data is 2012, which is the last official data recorded. And then came the bluefin tuna. As you know, tuna has a very high demand for the Japanese markets, okay, for sushi and sashimi, but also it can be sold for steaks. And uh, in January 2013, there was a record. 1.4 million euros were paid for one bluefin tuna, uh, 220 kilo bluefin tuna. The normal price is six euros per kilo for X farm price. Okay, but usually it's around 30, 50 euros as well uh, during the high season. So there you go, we have a fish with a very high price. And obviously, bluefin tuna farming started. It's difficult to get uh, tuna from a closed cycle system, from eggs. Okay, in fact, that's the research we're doing at the center right now. But um, tuna are generally capture-based uh, aquaculture, okay? They're caught in a per se net and then transported to, ca transferred to cages and transport it back to the farm site. So basically the cages go out all over the Mediterranean and they then they're towed towards the tuna are caught. Bluefin tuna's annual production reached a peak in 2007, after which there was a drop, again, overproduction, drop in prices, etc. And now also it's controlled by ICAT and by the European Union legislation. So catches are controlled and the production of tuna is quite stable throughout these years. So uh, we have quite a flow of tuna being caught and exported to Japan. So total annual production for aquaculture in Malta stands at 108.4 million as gross output value okay, in 2012, of which 14.1 million was from the close cycle species, that means sea bass and sea bream. So the main turnover comes from bluefin tuna. You can see there were quite a few uh, increases and a decrease here of the close cycle species, but generally we're moving upwards right now, and uh, the tuna should be stable at the, at the moment, and close cycle species, we're expecting a slight rise in the, year, in the coming years. So that's what happened till today. What happens in the future? As John said in the introduction, we devised a strategy which is passing through Parliament right now, uh, this, during this week, and we are identifying aquaculture as an important maritime sector in Malta, uh, good business value, um, we're steering growth towards sustainability, obviously, by doing research and trying to culture fish that are spawned in farms. 
okay, rather than basing aquaculture on a capture-based aquaculture, which can deplete fisheries. We're looking into new potential for growth species. We're doing the amberjacks, the bluefin tuna. We're also doing species like sea cucumbers and sea urchins at the center, and also looking into search areas in the sea where we can um, develop aquaculture. We're also improving our environmental management. Okay, so we're going to devise a program of uh, monitoring farms, for monitoring farms and the surrounding uh, environment. And also competitiveness through innovation, uh, such as for innovation of new products and new technologies. These are the species we do right now at the Mota Aquaculture Research Center. Okay, let's look to the future now, species diversification. What can we look into? Okay, so we do the sea bus and sea bring, which are already commercialized. And then we're doing research on the amberjack and bluefin tuna, as already mentioned. Now is the spawning season of the tunas, so we collect eggs that during this period. We also do meager white cream and sea urchin and sea cucumber, which we have already spawned and we produce juveniles from. And then we're looking into, for the future as well, dentex, red orgy, and grouper. So uh, these are the words and more, the names and more these charts of relevance here, and those are the scientific names. Our main projects are the Amberjack project, which is a Maltese joint venture project. By, it's a joint venture between the government and the private company. And the Translot project, which is an EU seventh framework uh, program um, that is coming to an end this year, but it follows up on previous programs of tuna domestication. A timeline for the Amberjack project. We started back in 2001 when we caught the juveniles from the wild. Okay, the juveniles have to be grown into broodstock so that you can get eggs from them. And um, in 2005, which is four years later, we managed to make the fish spawn 300 milliliters of fertilized eggs. And that was the catalyst that showed us that this can be possible. And in 2006, we signed an agreement with the private company who holds the cages and the broodstock and we started the Amberjack project. We've advanced over the years. In 2007, we produced 10,000 juveniles. In 2010, we produced 14,000 juveniles. And um, in 2012, we produced 80,000 juveniles. Last year, we had a problem in the hatchery, so we couldn't produce many fish. We didn't have any improvements. But as you can see, it takes time, and we only get one shot per year. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite, in, it's quite uh, laborious, and it takes time. And if you go in a wrong direction one year, you fail, and then you have to wait another year to get going again. So we're hoping to get a good run this year in 2014, although we had less eggs than usual, but we'll probably get better results. What are we looking into the future for Amberjack? This is when we first collected eggs from the cages. Okay, we collect eggs from the surface of the cages. Um, so we're looking towards spawning first generation Amberjacks that were hatched in 2008. Okay, we kept them as broodstock, they're now 20 kilos, but they're taking their time to spawn. So this year, we thought they would spawn, but they didn't. We have to wait another year. And we're starting working also with the University of Dusseldorf on genetic selection of the fish. Um, however, we encounter bottlenecks in cages. So we've overcome spawning, we've overcome juvenile production. Now we have bottlenecks in cages. We have a, jit flu a good fluke, which is uh, attacking the fish in their gills, okay, a parasite. And also we have intestinal problems in the winter when the temperature drops below 16. So these are problems we're going to try solving this year with this year's production. Now we come to the tuna. Okay, We have a series of dot projects. We call them dot projects because they're domestication of tunus. tunus. So uh, we started in the late 90s when a group of scientists got together and started discussing about making a meeting. And then in early 2000s, there was the DOT, what was called the DOT meeting in Cartagena, Spain, which was the first time I met Professor Chris Bridges. And uh, that led to a group of scientists getting together and applying for funds from the FP5 uh, framework program. And that's when we did the Riprodot project, which was a three-year project, which ended up with us getting fertilized eggs of tuna at the end of the project. So this was another progress, okay? We got to from studying tuna maturing to inducing fish in the cages to getting fertilized eggs. Uh, big steps were achieved, and then we also applied as a consortium for an FP7 project, which was the self-dot project. By the way, Riprodot was reproduction of bluefin tuna, and self-dot was self-sustaining aquaculture of tuna. And in fact, uh, this was indeed a success, 
as in 2011 and 2012, because the project had a slight extension, we got the juveniles to survive and transfer them from the hatchery to cages. So that was a big success. And now we have the FP7 project, which is coordinated by Frost Bridges. And it's called the Transport Project, which uh, deals with transferring the knowledge we gained in the previous project towards uh, commercialization. Okay, and that project finishes this year. This is basically to show you what the tuna spawning means, okay? Uh, the fish are over 100 kilos, sometimes we even have 200 kilo fish spawning. So they have to be kept in net cages, which are in the offshore, offshore outside. Okay, so we have to collect eggs from there. Basically, we, used, we induce the fish by injecting them with an implant, okay, and the diver shoots at them. The fish are tagged, and you can see, you, the diver can tell which fish have been induced. And then the fish spawn 48 hours after. The problem is, especially was the case in Malta, uh, is collecting the eggs because we have certain currents in the cages, so we can't collect eggs by just floating them to the top, as they did in Spain and in Italy. You can see the small size of the eggs, okay? They're one millimeter. And what you need is a land-based facility, as we have for amberjacks already, okay? Tanks big enough to allow fish to spawn in. So then the eggs can come to the surface and then you collect them in these nets on the side through overflow. Um, tuna egg collection is, as you can see, uh, this is cross bridges again. Um, eggs were collected from the side of the cage Okay, they come to the surface and we put a, a plastic layer all around the cage and uh, we collect eggs in that manner, which is very laborious and time consuming. So what we're doing now, since we have success to produce juveniles of tuna, we're looking into developing a spawning facility or a hatchery for bluefin tuna that has to have a very big tank. We're talking about a 25 meter diameter tank. This is larval egg, this is in Spain, our partners in the project. And uh, as you can see, the eggs are one millimeter diameter. And this is a newly hatched tuna larva, uh, which is about 3.4, 3.5 millimeters long. Um, usual systems, com when you compare to sea bream, sea bass, the usual green water technique is used. But obviously, there are differences in aeration, feeding methods, and some other parameters. So this is what we used to get until 2010. Our survivors in tuna, abnormal, small, bad growth. And this is what we started getting in Spain since 2011. Okay, so, and at present, now in our Spanish partners' cages, we have uh, tuna that were born in 2011 that weigh 15 kilos. And from 2012, we still have 200 tunas that weigh around five kilos. So, as you can see, we've reached progress. It's a matter of increasing the numbers. And that's what we're studying this year in our transit project. So, a collection base has been overcome, but we need an, a land-based facility. Just after hatching is also being overcome. There were problems with buoyancy of the larvae, which we're overcoming. <laughs> Larval egg problems, we're improving the techniques, the feeds, the enrichments for the diets. Okay, so we've got work going there. Um, we have a company producing feed for the tuna, which has been successful until the tuna reaches about 700 grams to a kilo. We have to produce feed for larger tuna now. And also, we have some problems when we transfer fish to the cages because uh, they hit the walls of the cages in the dark. So we have to light up the cages and uh, we're trying out other things to see how to get that survival. Anyway, we're moving ahead, but it takes a long time to get progress. And hopefully we can do this and start producing bluefin tuna on a commercial scale in the near future. This is what we're after. Okay, a variety of fish on display from farm from the farms, okay, farmed fish. Here you can see sea bass, sea bream. Uh, there's an amberjack here, a tuna loin, okay, uh, a meager, okay, that's what we're after. A variety of fish that can be commercialized and sold so that we can uh, provide the market, protein to the market, and also uh, save the fishing stocks with better management. By the way, this is not the fish here, it's a lemon, okay, so we'll get fixed up. All right, thank you very much. If you have any, pro um, any questions, please.